All right, we rejoin the action near the final step of the movement disassembly process, and as you can see, I've already removed the time side great wheel from um, its normal position. There's quite a bit of force there. If the loop had been mounted like this, when it was wound up, it would have wound up in the normal manner in which um, clock mainsprings uh, normally wind up, and it wouldn't have had this goofy coil here, but it was installed this way. And I'm not sure if that's on purpose or not, but you've got to be very careful um, removing these. You've got to deliberately um, pick it up and relieve it like that to get it off. And luckily, it... it um, seem to do a pretty good job of staying in position. I'm not going to uh, put it in there exactly, but if I was reassembling the movement, I would do just like that uh, to put it back in to get it to stay. And uh, this should this should come unhooked very easily. But um, I was very cautious. This was a very unconventional disassembly technique where I basically removed everything from the movement uh, except for the great wheels and the... Um, uh, hammer arbor that I could get out um, because I didn't want to risk those popping out and damaging some of the more fragile parts. But the clock is entirely conventional as far as an American clock goes. Um, here's the center uh, arbor with the hour pipe and the um, uh, lifting star and the clutch assembly for setting the hands. Very, very conventional. Um, Here's your um, count lever and locking lever and lifting piece. Uh, it follows the whole movement follows the pattern of a typical Ansonia clock company clock with the um, warning and um, lifting lever um, mounted to a small lever riveted to the back plate. Uh, so rather interesting, rather fascinating clock. Uh, anyway, so this is the. Uh, Time side mainspring, and if we um, unhook the uh, mainspring from the arbor, we see how it's supposed to be made. You see, there's the arbor there. You see, there's this large tension disc, and it's staked at the middle, and that makes it to where it's not floppy. If we um, remove the strike side here and oh, I want to look at uh, this part yeah you see it's come unstaked so the whole thing is is loose so that's gonna have to be repaired this is gonna have to be um, put back on there and then it's gonna have to be staked back down into place to so that the arbor uh, and the wheel are tight on each other, not able to flop around like that. That's unacceptable. So that will be handled. Uh, that looks like it's going to be our only repair. That will be handled in a separate video. And um, I should have some suitable tools to do that. It's just a matter of getting this positioned back in place and putting it on a suitable stump and then using something like a... Um, like a small chisel or something and upsetting the metal in a couple of places to pin that in the position to hold it just like this is and so that'll take care of that repair there and then the rest of this movement is just going to be a straightforward um, cleaning all the parts look to be in acceptably fine condition um, here's the escape wheel it's not an antique clock by any means so it doesn't have a uh, massive amount of wear but it is of incredibly high quality for the time period that it's made I gotta really um, give credit where it's due that the quality of this clock is what it is I mean I'm impressed uh, I'm not gonna sit here and try to um, go on and on and on um, but it's really neat to see something like this that was made 
uh, like when it was made. And it's interesting here, I see a little trick that's been done to help make the clock run a little longer. Uh, most eight-day clocks have two lifting pins for lifting the hammer tail and two locking slots. Well, this one has three locking slots and three lifting pins so that in order for this to make one hammer blow it only has to make a third of a revolution instead of a half and assuming all the gear ratios elsewhere are the same in the strike train except for possibly the gear ratio between this and this because this has got the warning pin and these need to be synced up it means you get a 50% increase in running time with that gear train with a given size mainspring. Because, like I said, you've got per one revolution of this wheel, you get three hammer blows instead of two. So very, tri um, very neat trick. And, of course, the count wheel, just the standard um, American-style clock count wheel. So, uh... All the parts are, I could probably mix these up in a pile of, of um, U.S. Um, clocks from the um, 19 teens time period, and you wouldn't be able to tell which parts are which. And um, it's very neat. I'll even go so far as to say it's neat how they copied the, um, the crossing arrangement of the Ansonia clocks and some of the other American clocks, too, where the larger wheels have got five spokes and then the... Um, um, smaller wheels up in the train have only got four. So, yeah, kind of neat. Anyway, enough of that. Um, see you for the next part, which will be making some repairs here to the main wheels, the great wheels. So this is Oklahoma Bridges. Thank you for watching.